Okay, welcome back. We are going to finish our discussion of multiple sequence alignments by introducing the latest, most modern approach. Let me just share my screen with you again. Okay, and that is the use of hidden Markov models. The hidden Markov models are a fairly advanced topic um, in computer science. Full discussion of, them, of HMMs is a bit beyond uh, the scope of this course, but we need to introduce them here and talk about them from, for two main reasons. Uh, one is that we, we see hidden Markov models in bioinformatics everywhere. They are a really powerful, useful tool for us, and so we need to at least understand uh, in a very general sense what they do. And the second is because they're a fascinating application of computer science um, to biological problems. So we're going to introduce them here as a way to calculate multiple sequence alignments. Again, since this is the last uh, lecture in this short series on MSAs, let's sum up. Our first approach was called the SPMIN, where we try to optimize the sum of pairs score of all pairwise alignments. Second approach was progressive, where we calculate a guide tree and we use that guide tree to select the closest related or shortest distance pair. We use that as the seed for our alignment. Iterative method built on progressive by adding refinement steps. And finally, today's topic, hidden Markov models. Hidden Markov models are a type of machine learning you need to refresh what machine learning is, you can go back to the slides on that from earlier in the semester. But it's one type of machine learning along with other ones you may have heard of called genetic algorithms or support vector machines or SVMs. So to understand what a hidden Markov model is, first we have to understand a little bit about what a Markov process is. This process is a model of a system that changes state based on only the current state. So you can think of this as somewhat of a myopic model, a short-sighted model. It sees just the current state of a particular system and then calculates the change in that state. Okay, so graphically, you might think of it in this way. We have a state of a system, state one. Then there is some probability that that state will become state two. We call that a transition probability. Correspondingly, there is another transition probability associated with state two becoming state three, and so on and so on. Uh, in a simple term, you might think of this as weather. So there is some state of weather that exists right now. Let's say it's sunny outside. There's some probability that the next state, the next weather we experience is going to be continued sunshine. There is also some probability that it's going to rain or snow or sleet or turn cloudy, however many different weather states we want to include in our system. Each of those transitions will have some probability. So if it's summertime, the probability of going from sunny to snowy weather is probably going to be quite low, whereas the probability of going from sunny weather to continued sunny weather may be fairly high. Okay. So a Markov process is a model of a system that changes based only on the current state. So we know nothing about the state before this one. It's sunny right now. What is the probability that it's going to be sunny at my next time interval, let's say tomorrow? When tomorrow comes, we look at the current state, it's sunny, and we calculate probability that it's going to be sunny the next time interval. We don't worry about what it was yesterday or the day before. Okay, so it's a fairly simple myopic approach to modeling, but that simplicity is 
what allows it to be somewhat tractable for our computers. You don't have to factor in huge amounts of legacy information. Was it sunny yesterday? Was it sunny the day before? Was it sunny on April 13th, five years ago, et cetera? All of that information is ignored by a Markov process. Here's another way to look at it down here, somewhat more mathematical way. <clears throat> we have states in the circles. Here's state one, here's state two, here's state three. The transition probabilities are these A, so there's transition probability going from A1 to A2. Transition probability to go from A2, X2 back to X1, or from X2 back over to X3, et cetera. Then we also have outputs on those states. Those outputs are what we actually see. Here's where our weather analogy breaks down, but we bring the outputs in when we talk about sequence alignment, which we're going to talk about in the next state. Okay. Each of those outputs, or what we observe, is associated with a probability or probability distribution of its own. So that's a Markov process. We're talking here about hidden Markov models. And a hidden Markov model is just a Markov model that we assume has one or more states that we can't observe. There's something that we can't see in this system. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean it doesn't affect the transition of one state to another or the output that we do see. So in this case, I've simply represented these hidden states or unobserved states by fuzzing out the state circles here. So we're observing the output. We have some states that we can't observe, and we have some probabilities that we can estimate somehow. We're, we need to use what we can observe, these outputs, to infer what the states are. Let's take a much more concrete example, and that is sequence alignment. So using a hidden Markov model in sequence alignment, what we observe are the alignment positions so we observe the sequence of a particular protein or um, DNA strand in a particular organism. And we want to infer the ancestral sequence. The ancestral sequence in this case is the alignment itself. So how do we do that? In practice, we use something called a directed acyclic graph. So we've talked about node edge graphs before. A directed graph is simply a graph with direction. We have a starting node and an ending node or a target node. Okay, so we, do, we um, visualize that using arrows on our edges. An acyclic graph is a graph that doesn't circle back on itself. So you never go from B to S and then back to V. That would be a cycle in the graph. So we use these DAGs or directed acyclic graphs to represent a hidden Markov model in sequence alignment. Here's a small example down here. So each of these rows here represents a sequence from an individual organism. Each of the columns represents a position. In this case, we don't know the ancestral sequence. We don't know the final consensus alignment. So those are represented by blank circles. But we do know the bases or residues at each position in each organism. For example, here in organism one, we have a V followed by an S, followed by a K, followed by a P, then an 
L, then a G, then a P, then an A, then an S. In organism two, we have an A followed by, and here we don't know yet what is in that organism from this graph, but we know from the sequence itself. And so by taking all of these sequences in each organism, creating a one graph, one DAG here that represents all of those organisms, we can then assign a weight to each of these edges. How many organisms have a V followed by an S? How many organisms have a V followed by a V and a V followed by a D, et cetera? Then we need an algorithm that finds the most likely path through this graph. Then we can run this algorithm, find the most likely path, after adding a new sequence. When you add a new sequence, you will change the weight on each of these edges that may change the most likely path through that graph. Then we add another sequence, recalculate the path, another sequence, recalculate the path. So the alignment is refined at each step, which is a positive. If we start with the wrong sequence or sequences, then that poor seed, just as in the progressive alignment, can result in poor alignment as those errors propagate to the final one. Okay, and just to finish up, there's something called a profile HMM. A profile HMM uses a multiple sequence alignment to create a profile or a um, set of probabilities. So based on the multiple sequence alignment we use as input, we can calculate the probability of finding particular combinations of residues or DNA sequences or DNA bases. We can then use this profile hidden Markov model to search for like sequences in a database. There are various ways to do this on NCBI BLAST already. One is called PSI BLAST. I encourage you to check it out if you're interested in hidden Markov models. <clears throat> okay, if you have any questions on this, let me know. I realize that's a very 30,000 foot view of HMMs. They are more mathematically complex than we've gone into here, but they have great application in bioinformatics and we'll talk more about those in different contexts later on in your class. Thank you and I'll see you at the next lecture.